know that you are a very informed audience and in your own areas of activity, um, you know everything about uh, the regulation. So what I thought I would do is to try to put the whole process of EU regulation in its co wider context to talk about how it has evolved since the early days, where we are now, and uh, to give a, a few uh, insights into where I think we're heading for the future. Because regulation has always been an important part of the European Union, the way it does business, its architecture. Um, that's for very fundamental political, economic, and social reasons. Um, political because regulation is really the way in which we make the basic bargain of trust between member states actually work. I open my markets to you if I know that there's going to be fair play. And since I don't trust a gentleman's agreement because member states are not gentlemen, uh, we have the Commission to uh, supervise and the Court of Justice uh, to be the final arbiter on whether the rules are uh, respected or not. So that basic political uh, trust between the member states needs regulation to make it work, and it has done since the beginning. Um, it's easy to talk about the economic benefits of regulation because um, uh, it's easier to work with uh, clear rules that don't change arbitrarily all the time, and we need a core, a common core of regulation to deliver the benefits of the single market uh, to all of our citizens. But the social dimension of regulation is also very important. <coughs> Europeans expect high standards of protection, of health, of safety, of environment. Um, and again, regulation is a way that the EU delivers on that promise to all its citizens. So these are the fundamental reasons why the EU is a community of law. It's a largely rules-based organization. Uh, I'll talk in a moment about the tensions that, that can bring, but it's also the way, the way that we have come so far uh, in terms of living and working together. And of course, getting it right is a very complex process. We have different cultures, different standards, different ways of doing things, and it's not just because we have 28 member states, but within certain countries you have regional local rules as well. So we have a very complex set of ways of regulating to try to bring together. And let's be honest, um, national regulation, local regulation also plays a protective role. Uh, and so uh, from time to time, those who are protected by uh, particularly tweaked national ways of doing things object when the rules are changed. Um, so it is a very complex uh, way of doing things. I find it interesting that when we do the Eurobarometer surveys, um, there is a consistently higher level of public trust in the European institutions than in national governments. And I think that's because, for all its faults and all the frustrations, the European system is seen to be objective, rules-based, and enforced without, without favour. Um, that, of course, in turn then generates uh, sometimes a political dislike of the regulation because it removes that area of that margin of discretion, that margin of manoeuvre from uh, politicians, whether they be national or local. So at every moment in time, we're always dealing with a complex trade-off between what do you do from the centre because it makes sense and what do you uh, do locally because that's where it makes sense and there are no wider implications. Um, last but not least, in terms of the complexity, you have technology and globalisation. They are changing our world very fast and faster every year. And it makes it extremely difficult for bodies like the European Union, which take a long time to reach decisions, uh, not because they are inherently slow, but because the need to consult and involve uh, takes a long time. That makes it very difficult to keep regulation up to date. Um, I suppose because I was a very long time in the Commission, I have lived through, um, I think, all of the different periods of, of regulation. When I started in Brussels, we were still in the full harmonization phase. The idea that everything could be done from Brussels, everything had to be the same all over Europe, and that that was the sort of federalist, uh, enthusiastic approach to things. And not surprisingly, this ran out of steam because it was neither physically nor humanly possible to do everything from Brussels. And I remember, even as a very young official, being a bit mystified about why would, did we want to harmonize jam jars so that you would have you know, 226 grams in a jam jar uh, for a half a pound of jam. 
But it was that kind of thing that ultimately led to the end of the total harmonization approach because it simply was not realistic. And then in 1979, we had the famous Cassis de Dijon judgment, which, in which the court has so often put its finger right on the spot and said, well, if something is legally produced in one member state, it should be legally able to be sold in any other member state. Now, as we know, real life isn't quite that simple, but that's the principle. And we have to keep coming back to that, that we, um, as the group of 28 countries, all want to protect our citizens, protect our consumers. We all want to have, have high standards. And so we should be able to find a system whereby we can have that trust in each other's products and services um, that you can feel free to, to buy in any part of the union and get the same level of protection. And the, the effect of the Cassis de Dijon um, ruling was to push the member states to agree on common standards, which they wouldn't otherwise have agreed. And this paved the way for what was called at the time the new approach in the early 1980s, where at European level, um, we started to concentrate on basic safety standards, leaving then a lot of technical detail to be worked out elsewhere, including by the standards organizations, which were, at the time anyway, deemed to be um, faster and better able to um, adapt to technical progress. At that time, too, there was a very strong preference for directives rather than regulation. This was partly a kickback against the total harmonization approach. Um, and I think there is an ongoing need to have directives which um, set the core uh, objectives, but which allow individual member states then to implement according to their own national traditions and practices. But there is another creative tension there, because if you ask most business people, they would like to have the same rules right across all 28 member states without any national interpretation, because it would make it easier for them to scale up. So we always have to find the right trade-off between the political uh, need to have room for the national practices to be taken into account versus the efficiency requirement of the, um, of the internal market. And that balance is struck differently at different times. It depends on what the mood is. But you can never have one without the other. You can't be so efficient that everything is by regulation. You can't be so... Um, sensitive to national differences that everything can be different because then you don't have an internal market. So getting that trade-off right is a challenge every day. It was interesting um, as time moved on then that we had the big bang of the 1992 campaign and I think it's one of the apparent paradoxes that it was necessary to pass 300 pieces of legislation in order to deregulate, but it was. It was necessary to replace a lot of national rules and obstacles by uh, a set of 300 uh, pieces of, of European regulation. And again, it's a, it's a paradox we often come to. Now, what I've been also struck by in, in all the time I spent in Brussels was, in the beginning, there was very little European regulation. You had the national rules were the ones that everybody knew, they were the ones that ordered how business was done, how people interacted with government, and they were the dominant um, body of legislation. But over time, because it made sense in so many areas to work together at European level and to have European legislation doing away with all these different national sets of rules, the amount of what we call the acquis communautaire grew and grew and grew. And it was in the Delors era that you began to see media interest in, well, exactly how many pages was this acquis communautaire? And the figure of 80,000 pages was calculated by somebody as a shocking, as a shocking uh, figure. But this cumulative buildup and this shift uh, in many areas to what we have today, which is a predominant amount of European legislation and a relatively smaller amount of national, in a way took people by surprise. And I think it was only um, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and with the beginning of the very intensive <laughs> pre-accession process preparing um, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe for membership that we really started to um, react to this maturing <coughs> of the body of European legislation. And um, it was illustrative for me that the Commission actually had no single database where we could say authoritatively, <laughs> this is the acquis communautaire. Only DG Agri had uh, something called, they called the Blue Angel, I don't know why, but the Blue Angel was a big ledger somewhere where somebody had written in every piece of legislation. So only the Common Agriculture Policy knew what its acquis was. 
Uh, and in the beginning of the um, pre-accession process with the uh, Central and Eastern European member countries, lots of DGs were running around trying to put together compendiums of what was actually their legislation so we could then take the candidate countries through it and help them prepare to accede. And that was a big difference from the last um, uh, accession of Spain and Portugal in the 80s. Uh, by the time we had the accession of of uh, the mid-1990s, um, those countries had been in EFTA, and so there had been the um, alignment of the legislation, so it made it a very easy accession. But the last one where two countries, Spain and Portugal, were coming from a very different system into the European Union, they had joined a much less integrated and therefore much less uh, regulated and much less demanding European Union. So it was, it was a big effort, and of course that, that effort now goes on ever since. Um, this gradual dawning of realisation that actually the body of European legislation was big and important and had to be treated as such also led over time to the uh, development of a lot of, of agencies uh, because it was realised that the Commission itself could never have uh, the technical expertise uh, to implement the legislation and also the Commission doesn't have a function to implement legislation. It proposes it, it polices it, it enforces it, but it doesn't actually implement it. So all of these were developments which, you know, when you look back on it, had a certain logic, but at the time, each one was breaking new ground, it was novel, it, it, uh, it was a different way of, of working. And I think the final historic element that I want to put into this mix, in the last 15 years in particular or so, um, you have had primarily in the debate in the UK, the domestic debate about, well, who's actually in charge and is it Westminster that ultimately decides or is it Brussels and the supposedly unelected politicians in Brussels who decide? And that um, constant um, attrition uh, coming from the UK in particular was gradually taken up by um, other, a number of other member states, mainly northern member states. Um, so there was this kind of feeling then that there was too much regulation coming from Brussels and something had to be done about it. Now, all of this is political, and one of the things that certainly struck very few people from the Lisbon Treaty was the way that comatology changed, and um, there was an attempt in the Lisbon Treaty to simplify um, uh, the <coughs> downstream of deciding on the big principles of legislation to downstream, to, to, to deal more efficiently with the downstream way in which we make technical regulation through delegated acts and implementing acts, but like everything else, that also became a political football between council and parliament. And you still have today a battle between the two arms of the co-legislator, one preferring the one it thinks gives it more power, the other one determined not to let the other one have that one and wanting the other one. So constantly, um, what seems to be very technical is actually very political. And the commission too saw it as a power play and wanting to please one time one, one time the other, would go more for an implementing one, more for a delegated act. The Commission has now lost a court case on that and has bowed out from that field. It will let the Council and Parliament decide what's the nature of the, 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 the implementing act or the delegated act, um, and I think probably very wisely. Um, but while all of this was going on, the Commission um, was also um, beginning to realise the, the change that had taken place. If you go back to the early period I was referring to, you had a situation where in most national ministries and departments, um, there was relatively little knowledge of the acquis communautaire. It was a kind of specialized thing. But over the years, you have had a complete shift. And now every head of unit in any ministry, in any uh, member state, will be very familiar with and know and understand not just what the rules say, <coughs> but also their impact. And so in a way, you've had a reversal. The commission has lost that expertise that it used to uniquely have. Uh, because it's shared, and, and rightly so. But what the Commission doesn't have is that knowledge of the implementation that the Member States now have through years of, of working with European legislation. And what we have to find is a way to bring that knowledge and understanding into the decision-making processes uh, in Brussels, because um, regulation will only work if it's seen to deliver and if it's seen to be sensible. Um, so this has brought us to the era of what we now call better regulation. And I think this has been, this is something I was very uh, much involved in myself. 
And I think um, it is a real attempt by uh, the Commission to understand the political reticence to having so much regulation decided in Brussels, even where the argument for doing so is overwhelming. So um, there's a um, much more investment now in consultation. You know, the Commission pub sorry, publishes its work program, sets out what it's thinking of, of working on, um, involves interest groups, um, uh, then does impact assessment to try to cost and quantify the, the costs and benefits of the different options it's looking at. Um, and only after that uh, long preparatory phase does a proposal actually go to Council and Parliament for a decision. I think that there's lots of positive aspects to this because I think it means that um, there should be no surprises. Um, everybody should know for a long time in advance that the, a proposal is being worked on. It allows the Commission to draw in so much expertise that it could never have. Uh, no civil service could have <coughs> the amount of expertise that you can get by consulting member states, um, business organisations, uh, NGOs, social groups, the public. Uh, so it, in, it allows you to draw in a lot of expertise to fine-tune decisions, to prepare in advance for implementation issues that will arise. But like everything in life, it also has drawbacks, and it is very cumbersome. It takes time. Uh, sometimes the process can be captured by lobbies or is per or perceived to be captured by different lobbies. And very often the process is perceived as dragging um, the standard down to the lowest common denominator rather than pulling it up to the, to the highest level necessary. But this is part of a big cultural change. And I think the, the final piece in that cultural change came with um, the arrival of President Juncker, who has made um, a solemn promise that the Commission will overall do less in the future. Now, I think this is first and foremost a response to the political perception of Brussels doing too much. And I think when he was on the campaign trail um, campaigning to be president of the Commission, he was quite shocked by meeting so many ordinary people who said, look, you know, it's too complicated, uh, it ties us up in knots, we don't see the point of it, it's a bureaucratic machinery. So it's a very personal commitment from him, but a very political one. I also think um, it, it makes a lot of sense because in a lot of areas we have now a very full body of legislation which is very mature and it doesn't need to be uh, constantly uh, revisited to squeeze the last 1% improvement out of it. What it does need is uh, a much stronger focus on implementation and a much stronger focus on enforcement. Um, and implementation is also part of the basic bargain between member states. Um, they have to believe each other that when they sign up to difficult compromises that they will all go home and implement the same thing. And that isn't always the case. And I still am naive enough to find it shocking that member states have to be fined sometimes more than once in order to live up to the side of the bargain that they themselves freely democratically struck uh, at one point in time. So the Commission has been stepping up um, the emphasis on, on enforcement, on implementation. It has developed something called EU Pilot to allow it to have uh, a friendly dialogue with member states about infringement proceedings to clear up a lot of things. It's surprising, um, particularly in more federal countries, how often the centre isn't even aware that there's an infringement of the rules because the competence is at local level or, or regional level. So something like EU Pilot allows, um, before you get into a very heavy legal process, just to clear up um, issues like that. Um, and it is interesting to see uh, regularly implementation issues coming up even to the European Council, um, where member states uh, want to contest uh, the basic agreements that they have struck between e each other or the fact that the Commission is taking uh, them to court. So it shows the importance of having uh, a neutral body that does the enforcement, does the policing of implementation. I think also... Um, Review and revision of uh, ongoing regulation is very important, but it is much more difficult than in a national context. If you have a law in a country that goes back 40 or 50 years um, and it's clearly uh, not uh, adapted to current day reality, there usually isn't much debate about <coughs> updating it. But in a European context, you have something that was worked out over many years, a delicate web of compromises with everybody giving, everybody getting, um, uh, and it's very difficult then to open it up again because opening it up again, you, you take back all the compromises that were made 
and you don't quite start with um, a clean slate, but you, you certainly risk uh, reopening all the compromises that were made. And the Commission itself is reluctant to reopen important pieces of legislation, because in the current climate, it feels that some of the major advances uh, in terms of European integration, would immediately be cancelled because the member states today would not sign up to things that they signed up two years ago. So that does pose a particular problem for keeping European regulation up to date. And very often, rather than opening an old directive, uh, the Commission and the legislator go to extraordinary lengths to try to add a regulation to it or to uh, build something in parallel rather than to call the basic bargain into question. And that does make it difficult sometimes then to explain to people why we don't revisit directives that were adopted in the 1960s or the 1970s. But if you don't understand um, that context, then you will never understand how to operate in the European Union. It's not just because something is old that it necessarily <laughs> needs to be demolished. Um, you have to find a way, and I think we, we have not yet found a good way, to keep the advances that we have made in the past, but to update the way in which we implement and apply them. And that, that is, I see that as a particular challenge on which we, we need to work harder. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about um, the growing importance of regulation as an, inter, as a, as an international issue. Um, I think in recent years, as tariff levels have come down everywhere, um, the process that we went through in the EU, you can now see it going, be, beginning to develop internationally. And the best example I can give of that is the TTIP. You have the EU and the United States, both rules-based systems, if you like. Um, but of course, over, um, over time, we have developed different ways of working. And you have two big negotiating groups, who are both of whom are most used to dealing with smaller countries, not used to dealing with equals. And so you have a coming together of um, uh, reasons why uh, a transatlantic single market would be a good idea, the same reasons why we have them in the EU, uh, to have the certainty that the other side will respect uh, the agreed rules and also um, that fewer differences would be good for trade. But even where you have um, industrial sectors who can agree on which regulations they would merge, abolish, or whatever in order to make trade easier, there you also have the regulators are more wary and the governments are more wary. Be one of the problems, I think, is because trade negotiators on the whole are not used to dealing with regulatory issues. So probably in future, other regulatory bodies will have to be involved in international regulations. And um, <clears throat> if you're interested in this kind of thing, there is a study which was done uh, on behalf of the Commission by two professors, Parker and Alamano, and they made a comparison of how regulation works on both sides of the Atlantic. And it's a very interesting description of the hows and the whys. And they come <coughs> to the um, conclusion that, in fact, when you strip away all the differences, actually we're trying to do the same thing, and there are many, many similarities. But um, they do have one paragraph that I want to quote because I think it really sums up the difference um, between how we regulate in Europe versus how we do it in the US. And they say, the design of the legislative and regulatory processes in the EU strikes an institutional balance, not between three coordinating branches of power as in the US, but rather among the Union as a supranational entity, the member states as sovereign nations, and the European Parliament representing the European citizenry in the process. And that's a fundamentally different thing from what the US as a federal country does. So we're negotiating, as I say, two blocks um, uh, equal. Um, and it's the first time for us to have that. Neither of us has a, the intention of fundamentally changing our own systems. You can imagine just trying to start the changing uh, what the EU has built up over more than 60 years. Neither of us is going to accept the other system. I think we're both realistic enough for that. So what we're looking for is how do you take two different systems and how do you find a way forward for the future that will allow the two big rules-based systems in the world to set international standards for the future? Because when, if the EU and the US agree to set standards, make regulations in certain areas, I have little doubt but that the rest of the world will follow. And I equally have little doubt that if we don't succeed in doing it, um, it will be others who don't follow rules systems, who follow um, might is right approaches, uh, who will dominate internationally in the future. So for me, that is the most important um, 
potential benefit of TTIP and worth fighting for. So I just wanted to develop that a little bit because I see this growth in the need to have uh, regulation at international level and the TTIP has a, a very good example of how we will iron out, which will take time, but how we will iron out some of the differences that, that emerge. Um, I don't want to go on too long because I want to hear from you as well. I hope we can have a, a sort of question and answer or comment and, and uh, reaction uh, session in the future. But let me sum up um, by saying this in particular. Um, for the reasons that I've given, I think regulation will remain an essential part of the EU way of working. Now, what we regulate and how we do it will change from time to time, as I said, from the sort of early federalist, let's harmonise everything we can get our hands on, to the Juncker commitment that we will do less because Brussels should only concentrate on the essentials. Member states are more than capable of dealing with everything else. Um, uh, I think we have many, many difficulties to overcome in trying to get this balance right. European society is ageing and as we age we tend to become more risk averse and in many countries people are calling for ever more detailed rules and I think that's, I observe that that's the case here too since I'm spending more time in Ireland now. Um, it makes sense to do some of this at European level but it doesn't make sense to do a lot of it at European level and that's also quite hard to explain to people. No, you have a good idea there is a problem, somebody needs to do something about it, but it shouldn't be Brussels who does it. That is just <coughs> as difficult for the Commission to, to make the case for as it was years ago to make the case for doing something. So we've, we've arrived at a different point in the political cycle, but where we need to be clear what should be done at European level together and what um, member states should be perfectly free to do or not to do at home as they see fit. I think... Um, the need for national expertise is huge, and I think that is going to be the way of working together in the future. Um, the, and that's why I think it's an excellent idea to have a network um, of national regulators, because I think um, in their own domain, each regulator, of course, knows more than anybody else. But there is a cross-disciplinary need to bring uh, regulators together, and also to think about the cumulative impact of, of, of regulation. Um, that is very, very difficult to do at European level or national level, uh, but I think we have to be more conscious of that in the future and try to have an exchange of information that allows us to see that if something is being done in one area, it will have either a positive or a negative impact in the other, or that instead of doing everything separately, we could perhaps put things together to make it easier for our society or for, for operators um, to, to be part of um, understanding intelligent legislation. And that's why I think um, it's very important to see the first of these kind of, of meetings coming together. I think maybe the, um, the crisis of the last years has made um, Ireland um, inward looking for, for lots of reasons. And also lack of resources has probably made it very difficult to participate as fully as we would have liked in all the European networks. Um, but I hope that we're coming out of that time now. And I think it's really important that Irish regulators um, find the right way to work with the civil service and, and our national representatives um, to work on the European um, regulatory framework <coughs> at an early stage. Because at an early stage, there is a, a genuine openness, a wish to receive the practice, the evidence, that's the necessary basis for a, a regulatory framework that will be accepted by the population. And it gets harder as the process um, goes further. It gets harder to influence. But I think that with our experience, we have a lot that we can contribute to shaping um, the, the European regulatory framework. So I really would strongly um, urge you to, 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 to be involved, even if it is boring and time consuming, and even if it is resource intensive. Because as I said, it stays there for so long, and because it has such a, a global impact, um, I think it's a really worthwhile investment. So uh, my, my conclusion is um, that you already uh, can see that the regulatory framework is very important, but it needs much more investment um, than in earlier years. It needs the involvement of those who uh, can tell um, the system, uh, in the co-legislators in Brussels, what is working, what is not working, we need to build up a confidence uh, among the regulatory community and with the political community that allows us to reopen occasionally uh, important pieces of legislation because they need to be overhauled. But there will have to be some kind of a political bargain struck 
on what's going to be touched and not touched if we're going to be able to do that. But fundamentally, I think we have to find the, the confidence to do that because, as I said, I think um, a regulatory system that's based on consultation, evidence, and um, that has been thought about in terms of do we need to do this at European level or do we not need to do it at European level, that's the kind of regulatory framework that will have broad public acceptance, even if people quibble over the detail. If we don't succeed in doing that, then it will be one more reason why people feel uh, um, unenthusiastic or frustrated with what goes on in Brussels in their name, and I think that would be a shame.